welcome to Rivers in the Desert, a revival ministry dedicated to bringing the living waters of God's love to a hurting and dying world. It is our desire as you listen to the following message that the Holy Spirit will fill you afresh and that you would be ignited into a fervency for Jesus. This is the day to be filled with the knowledge of His glory as the waters cover the sea. God is doing something new on planet Earth today, and you and I have the great privilege to be a part of it. We love you. Be blessed. chapter 11, New American Standard, as we begin tonight, talking about conflicts to come. Verse 32, and by smooth words he'll turn to godliness, those who act wickedly toward the covenant, but the people who know their God will display strength and take action. Or another word is, they will do exploits, Amen. as the King James says. Now exploits are, you know, there's a couple of interesting Greek words here, Septuagint, one is Nike. Ever heard of Nike before? <laughs> They're not something new. They actually borrowed it from the Greek language. It means something powerful. Okay, so my people who know their God will display Nike strength and take action. And so we're talking about a very powerful synergism for those who obey him. And exploits are those things that are not done before on planet Earth. Amen. And so a lot of times, you know, and I mentioned this this morning about ownership. And uh, ownership is something that I'm not going to try to motivate people by ownership. I mean, Continental Airlines versus Delta or Continental, you know, versus other airlines um, or Southwest or whatever do very good because they're employee owned. Meaning people have a stake. Right. You know what I'm saying? Where are people just working for a certain, you know, they just kind of schlep along and you know what I'm saying. So something that provides ownership gives people more incentive. And of course, we have nothing. We came into this world with nothing. We leave with nothing. But we have an ownership or a joint heir. Hallelujah. Yeah. Glory to God. An inheritance yeah, that's right. in the kingdom of God. And that's why we're. Oh, really? How about going back here? <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, what we want to. This all, let's just, Father. Get this word out via the web for those who don't know, those who need to know. Yes. Thank you for it, Father. Give me the right vocabulary tonight to explain to your Holy Ghost stormtroopers here and those that will be listening and watching via the web how we can maximize this hour and work in the harvest that is so ripe, but the laborers are few. I thank you for it, Father, in the mighty name of Jesus. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. Okay, Daniel chapter 11 and verse 32. By smooth words, he'll turn to godlessness those who act wickedly toward the covenant. But the people who know their God will display strength and take action. Hallelujah. So there's a lot of emphasis today on knowing God. And the outworking of that, the crop, the harvest of knowing God, is to do exploits and actions, Amen. operations. Are you excited about that? Yes. Amen. I'm always excited about that. Now let's go to 2 Corinthians to recap chapter 3. And uh, don't be disturbed tonight if you hear some things. But I'm under a flash flood warning. Hallelujah. <laughs> All vehicles out of the ravine. <laughs> Now, you have to understand what that means if you lived in Arizona, okay, or Israel, or the desert area, when flash floods come. You know, the, the water has nowhere to soak into, so when the water comes down, it's just like hitting pavement. It just, and it moves boulders the size of this room. 
and it comes suddenly and quickly, and that's why you have to be ready. So anyway, 2 Corinthians chapter 3, it's interesting also, you know, when I met, talked to the pastor in the parking lot after this morning's message, and he said, you know, the Lord spoke to him, the reason why his church has not grown in six years, because he's been lazy and hasn't been doing evangelism. And then he says, you know, there's something about evangelism. And I told him, well, we're, we're going to start doing evangelism, and you're welcome to join us. You know, I don't care where the sheep, the, you know, the sheep go, as long as they get evangelized and discipled. It doesn't matter to me. Hallelujah. And uh, we're on the same, I mean, same game here. And uh, he says, you know, there's such a grace in evangelism because, you know, it, it's like it, suddenly the favor of God will start hitting your church and start hitting you individually when you reach out to evangelize. And he says it's like a, a, a river breaking out in the desert. You know, suddenly it just comes out of nowhere. Glory to God. Folks, it don't rain very much down there. When it does, flash floods. And so 2 Corinthians chapter 3 Paul is talking about a more glorious ministry in verse 6. And having adequate, being adequate servants of a new covenant, not of the letter, but of the Spirit. For the letter kills, but the Spirit gives life. So we know right away if you study Old Testament history that the day the letter was given, which is the Torah, okay, 3,000 people died at Sinai. The day the Spirit was given at Pentecost... Actually, it wasn't, it was the baptism of the Spirit. You know, the Spirit was not given at Pentecost. The Spirit was actually given in John chapter 20, right. yeah. where Jesus breathed on the disciples. That's, right. That's where the Spirit was given. That's where they were born again. Pentecost, or Shavuot, was the, uh, the gathering together and the infilling of the Holy Spirit. And for the baptism of the Spirit, glory to God, and for endowment and being clothed with power to be God's martyrs. Anyway, so the day that the Spirit was given like that at Pentecost, 3,000 were born again. So the, the letter kills, the Spirit gives life. Right, right. And so Paul and everybody you know, would know this, you know, we just have to retool ourselves to understand these things. Verse 7 says, But if the ministry of death and letters engraved on stones came with glory, so that the sons of Israel could not look intently at the face of Moses because the glory of his face, face it was, how shall the ministry of the Spirit fail to be even more? Say that, even more, even more, even more with glory. So we know that the ministry of the Spirit is even more glorious, hallelujah, so we have a better way to bring people to the kingdom. Now the letter can bring people into the kingdom, the letter can give you a knowledge of sin, give you a knowledge of godly sorrow, okay? But the letter cannot produce in you the results the Spirit can of the new birth. The letter convicts you, the new birth, you know, is something by what David cried out, Lord created me a clean heart, okay? And he noticed when, he, when David sinned and he cried out in repentance in Psalms, and he said, Lord, created me a clean heart. He also said, restore to me the joy of my salvation. You all know what the rest of the scripture is? Then I'll return, I'll convert sinners to thee. Come on, catch it today. Hallelujah. Restore to me the joy of my salvation. Then I will teach transgressors thy ways, or then I'll, sinners will turn to thee. If you want to see that, go to Psalms. I'll show you real quickly. Keep your finger in 2 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians. Chapter 51, verse 10. Created me a clean heart, O God, renew a steadfast spirit within me. Now, folks, I want you to be jumping like Mexican jumping beings, okay, inside. Amen? <laughs> I don't want to have to shake the bottle and see things start jumping. You just start jumping and clicking around on your own because you are going to enter into the year of God's favor, the year of blessings by going into evangelism, by kickstarting yourself into, this, into an outreach. And verse 10, create in me a clean heart, O God, renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me away from thy presence. Do not take thy Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of thy salvation. Sustain me with a willing spirit. Then I'll teach transgressors thy ways, and sinners will be converted to thee. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So nobody wants to turn to a letter-driven, you know, a sourpuss, somebody looks like they've been drinking vinegar all their life, you know what I'm saying? Right. People, you know, are attracted to joy, amen? People attracted to, now I'm not talking about happiness, happiness is based on circumstances, I'm about joy, and inner joy, hallelujah. 
that you know him intimately. You know your sins are forgiven. How blessed is a man or woman whose sins are, are not held against him. You know, there's such a blessing in that. And so 2 Corinthians chapter 3, Paul says we have a more powerful ministry, and it's the ministry of the Spirit. And I don't think that we in our generation have really tapped into this reservoir. And the reason why is because you can get up with a golden tongue orator, you know, the Baptist churches, the Methodist churches, denominational churches for years have thought prophecy just means inspired preaching, okay? And so they will get the most, you know, eloquent speakers, you know, and all these different, you know, dynamics going to what for? To get people into the altar. And, you know, God bless Billy Graham, and that's what they would do. At Billy Graham converse, uh, conferences, I've been a part of them before as a young believer, you know. They'd he'd come to a certain city, and all the churches would, you know, out of love for the lost, would rally together with Billy Graham, you know, running the banner. And they would teach us in a counseling session, you know, to dress like unbelievers, you know, to come, you know. And when the altar call is given, and the dear man starts singing, you come as you are, whatever, or amazing grace, that I would, should get up from my seat and start moving along as though I'm going to the altar myself, and that will help cause those that are a little fearful to stand up. Now, folks, if it's taking that to bring people to the altar, then we've got some major problems. That's right. That's right. Because in Finney's Revival, which I read about this morning, Finney's Revival, in his autobiography, and if you don't have it, I can give it to you, give you the rest resource, you can read it. In his autobiography, he says he would be riding on horseback. He would get 50 miles from the city and people falling out of their buggies and off their horses, farmers laying in their fields under conviction of sin. Go into the city even before the meetings start, and all the prostitution houses and the bars are shut down. People in the streets rolling, crying out for God. Hallelujah. <laughs> Hallelujah is right. Whole cities under the power of God. You should read about the revival in Utica, New York, where Vinnie walked into a large uh, uh, textile factory, looked at one young girl needling there, and suddenly she began to weep because of her sinful condition. And it spread throughout the entire factory. The manager said, shut down the factory. We'd rather look after the condition of our souls than make textile. This happened in many places in the late 50s and early 1860s, right before the Civil War hit America. Brothers and sisters, hallelujah. And when I read this stuff, I don't want anything else. You know what I'm saying? I mean, once you eat, hallelujah, a good gumbo shrimp, hallelujah, from New Orleans, why should I go eat some, some other, you know, <laughs> imitation in, uh, say, uh, Minnesota? Yeah. Yeah. Maybe that's not a good information. Maybe, you know, what's it like catching a salmon in British Columbia and eating it right there I mean, and then going to the store and buying some freeze-dried stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe that's not good enough. <laughs> well, you understand what I'm saying, folks. There's something about when you read those things, when you study the history of awakenings and revival, it, 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 it touches every fabric of society. And I don't have anything else to live for except that. And don't blame me, I'm preaching like this and pressing people's buttons and pushing you forward stronger. And don't blame me, you better blame Jesus. Hallelujah. Because he's the one who touched me and apprehended me. Yeah, that's right. And I could never preach anything else. Amen. I could not go and do anything else, but then he'd kill me. Hallelujah. <laughs> Moses didn't want to go. And finally, he talked his way out of it, had his brother be his spokesman. Finally, Moses on his way, and didn't even circumcise his sons, and God came after him to kill him that night. And so it goes on and says here, verse 9, for the ministry of condemnation has glory. How much more does the ministry of righteousness abound in glory? For indeed what had glory in this case has no glory in the account of the glory that surpassed it. For if that which fades away is of glory, much more that which remains is in glory. Therefore, having such a hope, we use great boldness in our speech. We're not as Moses who used to put a veil over his face, that the sons of Israel might look intently at the end of what was fading away. But their minds were hardened to this very day at the reading of the old covenant. The same veil remains unlifted. It's removed in Messiah. But at this day, whenever Moses is read, a veil lies over their heart. But whenever a man turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. Now listen, we are dealing with a people group in North America, okay? A lot of people have a religion, a religiosity, I should say a churchianity about themselves. Are you a Christian? Are you broken? Oh yeah, I go to this church, okay? So there is a veil over their eyes, just like there was over the children of Israel's eyes. And the only way this veil is removed is when that man or woman turns to the Lord. 
Now, we're not talking about God the Father or God the Son. We're talking about God the Holy Spirit. Let's read this. Verse 16. Whenever a man turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. Now, the Lord is the Spirit. Spirit. And where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom or liberty. So meaning that there is a lot of God talk out there, a lot of talk about the Bible, a lot of, you know, you know, good-natured, good-hearted words to get people to love God, but unless the Spirit of God is there or unless there's liberty and spontaneity, it's just the old dead letter. Yes. Yes. Amen. Amen. Now the Lord is the Spirit. Whoa! So we're not about ta- turning, turning to God. We're about turning to the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit, his job is to convict and reprove. And he's hovering over the earth. And the Bible says he'll not always strive with man. He'll not always be on the earth. His job is to come here convict of righteousness and sin. And so the Holy Spirit is the greatest soul winner. He's working 24-7, so to speak. He's giving people dreams. He's, he's sending out his softening agent to soften people's heart, you know, to get people ready for the, for the entry of God's word. And you and I are the carriers of the word. Angels don't lead people to Jesus. We do. The task of preaching and winning men and women to Christ is done through the agency, not of the pulpit, but for the believers going out into the marketplace. Now look at this way. We have figured out if we get the nicest steeple, the nicest programs, the nicest sound system, okay, and then we try to lure people in here, and the acre of the church, okay, sanctuary, has become the most evangelized acre on planet Earth. And some people have seen that, and they're progressive, and they're thinking, listen with the Spirit, and they're trying all these other avenues to reach people, and I have no problem with that. But I want to see it endued with the power of the Holy Spirit. I've been involved in spirit-led evangelism. I ain't going back to anything else. I love spirit-led evangelism. Now, I was a part of an outreach in Washington, D.C. Everything was, um, uh, how would you say, everything was <laughs> controlled. Everything was, uh, you know, told us what to do, the tracks we were to pass out, how we were to respond to people, how we were supposed to say things like this, and what we were supposed to pray for, etc. And uh, I clashed right away with the leaders of this because it was all, it, nothing, it was nothing at all spirit led. And so what happened was they said, okay, well, you know, we're not going to listen to what you say because we, quote, quote, know what we're doing. We've been doing this for years. I said, fine, I've been doing it for years also. And I just took the back seat and see how they ran things. What happened is that they would send out different teams, okay, different places in Washington, D.C. And I was a team leader, okay. They just wanted me to get out away from them, okay. And I t- sent a team out. And so we would come back with all these reports, people getting saved and healed and signs and wonders. And, and so all the young people and all the people, so to speak, that were on fire for God were saying, well, we want to go with Scott's group. So all the other groups began to fizzle out. They said, I'm go with my group. And again, they, I got in pro- trouble with them, not with God, with them, okay? And I said, hey, listen, guys, you don't know anything. So the pastor of the church who's been in ministry for many years took me in his car one night and says, listen, can you please teach me about evangelism? And I looked at him and I said, you've been in ministry all these years. You are a quote, quote, leader in this messianic movement, and you don't know anything about evangelism? That's scary, folks. That's like going to the meat market, the butcher, and ask the butcher, you know, I would like, you know, some chicken breast. He goes, what's that? Well, what do you do here? Oh, I just cut up whatever I look at. It's, I just cut up stuff. Read this book and just cut it up. I don't know what I'm giving you. That's scary, folks. It's like me going to the fish store to buy some fish food for my kids, for the fish, okay? And the guy says to me, I said, what about this fish? What is it? He goes, I don't know. I don't, I just own the store. It's like, What? Give me a break. Now, don't get upset at me, okay? But most pastors I talk to know nothing about evangelism. And the reason I go to their churches is to get them fired up for evangelism. And the excuse is always this. Well, we're not ready for it yet. Our people aren't trained for it. That is the lamest excuse I've ever heard in my life. I won't go into all the details why that's lame, okay? But it's basically because people are not ready for persecution and rejection. You'll never be ready for it. So just go ahead and push him off the diving board. Hallelujah. Just push him in the water. 
You take all the books you want to, learning how to swim and all these other things. Just, you're not going to do anything until you get wet, okay? Just get the people out there and let them learn as they go. And so you get around all these different evangelism techniques, okay, whatever. But I like this one. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. There's something about spontaneous spirit-led evangelism that to me is the most exciting adventure on planet Earth. Verse 18, but we all with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, are being transformed to the same image from glory to glory, just as from the Lord, the Spirit. So we are being transformed into his image with an unveiled face if we allow the Spirit to have liberty to do what? To bring people to a born-again experience. And uh, so, you know, I just, what I did is, is the river, we got touched by the river in the, in the 90s and began to travel and get people, churches involved in evangelism, not just sit around and soak all the time. Um, I had one of the leaders of uh, the biggest revival organization in the world come up to me and said to me, you know, you're the only revivalist that does evangelism. I was like, what? What? What do you mean? He said, oh, they all, they saw, they know how to evangelize this area of the church when people come in, okay? But none of them goes out there and does anything about it. And he told me that he was concerned about the quote, quote, river movement, that it was about to wash up, okay, on, on the shore and be left dry on the shoreline if there was not more evangelism. That's what he told me. And sure enough, most of the river churches, most of the renewal centers, okay, are closed down now because evangelism is not the main priority. So if we're wise, we will take heed, okay, that we're not here as a bless me club, amen? If I'm being airlifted into Afghanistan to look for bin Laden, okay, I'm not going to be sitting around the poppy fields enjoying the beautiful poppy flowers, okay, or the Afghanistan food, okay? Or getting to do some horseback riding, okay? Oh, I love horseback riding, yeah. I get there, I go out with the Taliban, ex-Taliban people. We go horseback riding up in the mountains. Do a little snow skiing, you know, if I get a chance. You know, get some really big mountains up there by Tora Bora. This time of year, got a lot of snowfall up there. Yeah, it's going to be a great trip. What? What do you think the, a full bird colonel is going to do? We didn't send you in there to like Afghan food. You got a job, Period. Are you with me, folks? We're not supposed to enjoy this life. We're not supposed to enjoy and get too comfortable here. We are passing through. Look at your neighbors say, we're passing through. And as we get before him, we stand before him on that day. We're going to give an account of our lives. I love what my former pastor, Billy Joe Doherty, said. He was, a, he was recruited out of high school to play football at a state college out of Arkansas. And he was getting pretty good at football as a quarterback and, you know, had a lot of um, things going for him. And he got born again during that time. And, and he remembers that um, he was on the practice field in full gear. It was a practice day and uh, running plays. And, and uh, all of a sudden, he had this vision. And he had this vision of his life. That he, he married his wife, Sharon, who was his girlfriend at that time, and they had children, and, they, and they, he started a business, you know, and would go to church and was a good Christian, et cetera, et cetera. And then at the end of his life, would retire at a beautiful lake, you know, in Arkansas with a, a cabin and a boat, you know, and just a good old life, you know, like the Golden Pond, you know, that old Jane Fonda film, okay? Just a grand old life, you know. And then he would die and go to heaven and look back and take none of those things with him that he worked all of his life for. And then he saw another why in the road if he would choose this way, that he would stop playing football if he would go to Old Roberts University and train for ministry, that at the end of his life, he, God said, you'll still have things, you'll still have a house and car and those things, okay, but those things won't possess you. They'll be given to you, and then at the end of your life, you'll look back as you enter into glory, and you'll see all, all those things you can't take with you will burn, but all the people that you touched and helped will be coming in behind you, and that is your reward. And he's weeping and crying, you know, slobbering all over himself, takes off his helmet, and quits football right then. And he would hammer us all the time with that vision. All the time. I mean, listen, he's driving to church. Here is this, he's driving to church and he would pull over his car and pick up hitchhikers and bring them to church. 
It doesn't matter. I mean, the guy, folks, <laughs> that's all he thinks about is souls. But he's a pastor. He's not an evangelist. I remember when he, God told him to get into Russia right away. And he would fly into Russia once a month and do big crusades in Russia. This is before the Iron Curtain fell. I was there during those times, folks. It's amazing. And so we have, for whatever reason, we have to be drilled with this over and over because this type of ministry is not comfortable to the flesh. Now, when I was at Old Roberts University, let's keep on going here, chapter 4 and verse 3. If our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing. So the reason people do not get born again is because they are veiled with the same religiosity, okay, that the Israelites had. Now, we have to key in on this because the Israelites saw the glory. They felt the ground shake. They're eating manna, okay? Yeah. They're drinking water from the rock. They even asked for some quail. People drop on, on the spot dead, okay? They saw the Egyptian bloated dead bodies and the horses wash up on the Red Sea shoreline. They saw the firstborn dead. They had all the gold and silver with them. From their Egyptian friends. Think about what they saw and they still were veiled. Yeah. Why did they get veiled? Because of fear. Not because, listen folks, yeah. can you imagine 400 years of slavery and you're going out? Yeah. And you got all that 400 years of back pay going with you? Yeah. <laughs> and you're going out into the desert to worship, okay? Yeah. And they see the, the mountain, and, the, and even Moses says, I was full of fear at the sight of the glory of God on top of Mount Sinai. Woo! None of their shoes wore out, ladies. Think about that. Their clothes didn't wear out. There was no one sick among them. Even the livestock were healthy. What more can you ask for? Air conditioning cloud by day, heating pillar by night. Yeah. Amen. The, we got your families, you got your loved ones. You're going out of Egypt. You're going back to the land of promise. Whoa! Yes. And why were they blinded? It's the same reason people get blinded today. God says, okay, take 12 spies, do some recon. Yeah. Remember, the ministry of reconciliation begins with reconciliation, okay? Yeah. Recon is a military term to go scout out an area, okay? Intelligence gathering. Glory to God. That sounds like fun. And so they went to do recon, remember that? And they came back with the correct report. There's giants there. But 10 of them got scared. Say that. Scared. We can't do it. Joshua and Caleb said, wait, be quiet. Let's see what they said. Come on, go to, go to Numbers 14. You say, you're pushing my comfort zone. I had planned to start getting my garden ready, you know, and... Do this and do that. <laughs> Folks, <laughs> if, you, if you pursue what gives God delight, he'll give you what gives you delight. Amen. Numbers 14. Actually, Numbers 13. Now, let's look here at how the veil came. Because I don't want the veil on me. I don't want the veil on you. Amen. Now, verse 22 of chapter 13 when they had gone up into the Negev, they came to Hebron, <coughs> where Avicham, Sheshi, and Talmi, the descendants of Anak, were there. Now, the descendants of Anak, okay, these are the kinfolk of Goliath. These are the giants, okay? Now, Hebron was built seven years before Zoan in Egypt. They came to the valley of Eshkol. From there, they cut down a branch with a single cluster of grapes. They carried it on a pole between two men and some of the pomegranates and the figs. That place was called the valley of Eshkol because of the cluster which the sons of Israel cut down from there. When they returned from spying out the land, recon, at the end of 40 days, number 40 is testing, they proceeded to come to Moses and Aaron to all the congregation of sons of Israel in the wilderness of Paran at Kadesh. Now, we've been there. Remember that part, spot where Moshe took us, you know, at Har Kakom? And remember the place where the Egyptians were waving the white flags at us, the white towels as we were driving by in the bus? You remember that? You remember that at all? Where Moshe, Moshe, all the ladies had to go to the restroom, and he said, oh, yeah, go over there in that corner. Okay, remember that? <laughs> and the Egyptians are waving at us as we go by in the bus, right? Yeah. That's the wilderness of Paran. Just on that side is Kadesh Barnea. That's where they were. And there's nothing out there, folks. Yeah, that's right. There's nothing out yeah. there. I mean, if these guys are bringing fresh deli products from the Jewish deli, hallelujah. 
in the middle of the desert. That's exciting to me. They showed them the fruit of the land. Verse 27. Then they told them and said, We went to, into the land where you sent us, and certainly it does flow with milk and honey, and this is its fruit. Milk and honey doesn't mean literal milk and honey. Honey represents the, the, the agricultural, and milk represents the herding, okay? The sheep and goats. It's a land of great agricultural and, herd, and, and herds, okay? Nevertheless, the people who live in the land are strong. The cities are fortified. And very large. Moreover, we saw the descendants of Anak, or the giants there. Amalek is living in the land of the Negev. The Hittites, the Jebusites, and Amorites are living in the hill country. And the Canaanites are living by the sea and by the side of the Jordan. Then Caleb quietened the people before Moses and said, We should by all means, I like it, come on, the Way and Means Committee. I thought it was the Ways and Means Committee right there. <laughs> This is the Ways and Means Committee. I like this guy. We should by all means go up and take possession of it, for we shall surely overcome it. Yeah. And there's not one of us have not been tempted, okay? And God even told Ezekiel, don't even look at their faces. Don't even look at them. Because I'll make their foreheads like flint against you. They'll tie you up and put you in your house. You'll be a sign and wonder, a byword, a proverb to these people. So why do these people who saw the glory, who saw these things, get blinded? Well, it's, let's keep on going here. Verse 31 is the key. But the men who had gone up with him said, we're not able to go up against the people. They are too strong for us. Notice my emphasis on strong. Just look at the strong one who made everything, hallelujah, and you'll be filled with total faith, okay? So they gave out to the sons of Israel a what report? A bad report of the land, saying they spied out the land through which we have gone, and spying it out is a land that devours its inhabitants. Where did that come from? Right. And all the people who saw him are great in size. There also we saw the Nephilim. Who are the Nephilim? Well, keep your finger here. Go back to Genesis. The Nephilim, Nephal in Hebrew means the fallen ones. Chapter 6, the corruption of mankind. Genesis 6. You all get something out of this? Now it came about when the men had begun to multiply on the face of the land, and the daughters were born to them, chapter 6, verse 1, that the sons of God saw that there were daughters of men were beautiful, and they took wives to themselves, whomever they chose. Then the Lord said, My spirit shall not strive with man forever, because he also was flesh. Nevertheless, his days should be 120 days. Year, excuse me, the Nephilim were on the earth in those days, and afterwards, when the sons of God came into the daughters of men, they bore children to them, those who were mighty men, those who were old and renowned. Then the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great, and every intent of his thought was evil continually. I believe we're at that point right now, but look at, look at verse 11. Or verse 9, and these are the records of Noah. He was what before God? He was blameless. That's the missing ingredient of mountain moving faith is to be, have a blameless heart. Hallelujah. Why do you think I pound so much, folks, on TV and all this stuff? Listen, I used to be a TV addict like most Americans, okay? But when I got into this well of purity and I saw the signs of wonder follow, and I saw what happened inside of me, glory to God. I was like, ooh, this is, this is like miracle mud. Hallelujah. This is... <laughs> This is like barley green or whatever you want to call this stuff. This is the best thing since sliced bread. And verse 11, now the earth was corrupt in the sight of God, and the earth was filled with what? Violence. Violence. It's the Hebrew word Hamas. Write it down, folks. The earth was filled with Hamas. Is that happening today? It's beginning to happen again. Yes. We have millions of Muslims. Okay, that are filled with violence. Hamas. 
And Jesus said, as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be the coming of the son, the days of the coming of the Son of Man. They were building, they were marrying. Come on, a lot of construction going on, a lot of marriages going on. Everybody was prospering, building their houses, building their businesses. And suddenly the dame came like a thief in the night. How do we know we're at that time? Is the rise of Hamas, violence. Oh, is right. Go back to Numbers 13. So the Nephilim, we, I don't want to get into speculation. We don't know a lot who they were. We don't know if they were fallen angels. We don't know a whole lot about them. You know, you can read Dake's commentary. You can read others. Fine, whatever. A lot of it's speculation. Those things we're not supposed to know. We're just to know topical points about who these people are. Put it that way. And I'm not interested in really knowing them much more than that. That's right. Amen. Speculation divides a lot of people. And so verse 33 of chapter 13, this is where it came in, the hardness of heart or, or the blindness, the veil. Are you ready, folks? Yes. There we saw the Nephilim, the sons of Anak, a part of the Nephilim, and we became like grasshoppers in our own sight. And so we were in their sight, a bunch of sissies, spineless half-milers. They got scared because of circumstantial evidence. God will send you in. Now, the first point of doing evangelism, recon, okay, that we're going to start doing here, and I'm excited about it because it's going to bring a fresh momentum, like a fresh tidal surge into this congregation, and it's going to bring people into this church. Hallelujah. It's going to cause other churches to grow. We're going to cast out more devils out of people. Hallelujah. Glory. <laughs> We're going to have more testimonies and exciting things happening. There's going to be no more staleness in your life. But the first thing we have to recognize is that we cannot look at circumstantial evidence. God will actually put us up to the mountain to make us realize that we can't do it. Yeah, that's good. Yeah. God, I need your help because I can't do nothing here. Yeah. God says, good, out of the way, son. Let me take over. The battle is mine, not yours. That's right. Now, you understand this. Folks, this to me is an oxymoron. This to me is the height of hypocrisy. Because they stood on the Egyptian shoreline of the Red Sea, crying out to Moses. Even Moses cried out. And God said, quiet the people. The battle's not yours, but mine. Can you imagine the number one army in the world and their chariots? How about today? All, you know, divisions of M1 Abrams coming at you. We have laser-guided munitions, okay? Can you imagine, come on, an Egyptian-type army, okay? Can you imagine a Marine division coming at you, an amphibious unit? And they control the night, okay? And you got all these red laser dots. And you know who's pointing at you. You got satellites working against you. You got spy drones, okay? There's nowhere you can hide. And God says, be quiet. The battle is mine. And the people with their very eyes saw the Red Sea open. I would have loved to have been there. Man, I'd be picking up corals and fish. Hallelujah. Whew. Look at that species. Wow, I never saw that thing before. <laughs> Walking through that thing. And to see it come back on top of the Egyptians. I don't know about you folks, but... I have no problem with God judging these people. You know why? Because they got afraid. Now, it's different if they never saw God move before. Right. Yeah. But they saw what happened in Egypt. They saw the plagues. Yeah. They lived in Goshen. All their cattle were healthy. All of the Egyptian cattle got mad cow. The hell, can you imagine? All this stuff. Why am I harping on this? Because we cannot let any circumstances enter into us and paralyze us. Amen. It's called the analysis of paralysis. You should write that down. The analysis of paralysis. You start analyzing something too much, you'll get paralyzed in your faith. Yes. It's better to walk in with blind faith, Amen. 
Because a lot of times, if God told you what he's going to do with your life in the future, Debra, you probably have 10, 10 hissy fits and 15 nervous breakdowns and, oh God, I can never do that. And so he takes us step by step, little by little, inoculation by inoculation, builds up our faith, amen, till we come to a place that we know him, we love him so much. Why do you think all this intimacy and bridal teaching has been going on? Because he wants us to go do something. It's not time for the marriage yet. It's time for the bride to get on her army boots. And if I can see all these young men and women, okay, dressed in their new computerized camouflage marine units, okay, clothing, in Hartsfield International Airport, okay, carrying heavy backpacks, okay, calling their girlfriends and their moms, okay, for the last time before they get on an airplane to fly overseas, okay, and I don't see fear in their eyes. I see determination. I see a mission. Hallelujah. I don't see a bunch of people wet behind the ears. The people wet behind the ears, behind the microphones and the talk shows, okay? Yeah. And, the, and the armchair quarterbacks, okay? All the complainers. And you can't hang around like a, you can't soar like an eagle if you're surrounded by a bunch of turkeys. That's right. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Turkeys are sissies. A great horn owl will find out where turkeys are, are roosting at night and come in, glide in silently and just take them out. Have itself a good hot meal. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> Amen. Hallelujah. I think turkeys are the biggest, one of the biggest birds in North America. But a smaller great horned owl can take them out. Yeah. Flush them out. Because they're, all, they're motivated by fear. Watch out who you hang out with. And so it says we became like grasshoppers. I make mean, understand we became like dogs, we became like, you know, <laughs> gerbils or hamsters or <laughs> But grasshoppers, I mean, what, what kind of thinking are these people? That's what fear does. When you look at it, oh, I can't do that, I can't do that, I can't do that, I, 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 you talk yourself right out of it. And guess what? The devil doesn't bring the veil, God doesn't bring the veil, you brought the veil on yourself. Well, what's going to happen if we go street witnessing? Maybe somebody will knife me. What do you think like that for? You're watching too many programs. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. You know, negatives are where, you know, dark images are developed. And not, you know, you don't go into, you don't develop your negatives. You only develop your positives, okay? That's So it's a mind game. Come on, we're talking about psychological warfare. Write that down now. What we're entering into is psychological warfare. Psychops, okay, by the enemy. Because he wants to tell you that you're going to die. You're going to get mistreated, okay? Yeah. Now, we're not like we're going to run into a biker's bar tonight, you know. And turn off their music and start preaching to them, okay? We're going to use some wisdom here, amen? And we're not looking for a fight either. But we're not scared of a fight. Like one of our presidents said, the only thing to fear is fear itself. Hello? Yeah? Too bad he couldn't control his wife. Anyway, how about Roosevelt? <laughs> She was a mess. She go have she she was anyway. Don't get me off. Okay, don't get me going. Talking about Democrats, by the way. If you listen to the way they talk, <laughs> they have, they're just full of fear. Oh, we've alienated all of our NATO partner European friends. Oh, we're in the world. Oh, Bush this, Bush that. Well, give me some answers. You bunch of complainers. I don't mind constructive criticism, but what about some solutions? Yeah. And don't tell me Hillary is your solution. She couldn't find her way out of a wet paper bag underwater. <laughs> Amen. I'm glad President Bush is in there right now. 
that that's some chutzpah, amen? And didn't roll over when all the Canadians started getting mad at him, the liberals, you know, and then the French and everybody else, amen? And it says, I, did, I, I measure my success by how many critics I have. <laughs> Good for him, hallelujah. Hallelujah. And so we became like grasshoppers. That's an evil report. An evil report is not just recon, this is the facts, okay? It's taking those information saying we can't do it or God can't do it. Yeah. That's an evil report. That's right. That's right. And when somebody comes to me with that type of confession, I become like a Holy Ghost, you know, gorilla in a china closet, okay? Do not tell me that. Not when I read my Bible and I see imperfect people with uh, all types of problems in their lives break through with God. Don't tell me that it's not possible. Out of my way. <laughs> and so 14 verse 1, then all the congregation, listen to this, all the congregation lifted up their voices and cried and the people wept that night. Bunch of sissies, cry babies. <laughs> Why were they crying? And the sons of Israel grumbled against Moses and Aaron, and the whole congregation said to them, Would that we died in the land of Egypt? Why we die in this wilderness? Why is the Lord bringing us into this land to fall by the sword? Our wives and our little ones will become plunder. Would it not be better for us to return to Egypt? Yeah. We know for another complaining session, okay? Not a, you know, oh, these, this is a brainstorming session. It's not a brainstorming session. <laughs> this is not a management meeting. This is a bunch of complainers. Amen. <laughs> Why? Were, were they naturally like that? Yes, but no. Okay, but there's, that's, there's some good people in there. We'll see later. But why? Folks, come on. Look at me. Fear is your enemy. Yeah. It is a spirit. Yes. Mind games is what the devil wants to play with you. Well, what if this happens? Whoa, whoa, whoa. What if that? Well, if I lived like that, I wouldn't get out of bed in the morning. Yeah. <laughs> well, the car, you know, I need to get my, a, a special car that has airbags everywhere, okay? Yeah. I got to be careful what road I drive on, you know? You got to be careful what, you know, deodorant I use. This has got aluminum in it. Oh, and you know, well, with the fluoride, I'm, I'm in the toothpaste. I mean, come on, live like that. Oh, the fluorescent lighting. Oh. oh, I burn pictures. Oh, I can't watch this because some Muslim extremists will see me talking against them and come after me. Yeah. Well, here's the, the crosshairs. Here's the target right here. I refuse to live in this fear. Yeah, right. You say, what if I get killed? Praise God. No more bills. No more complainers, hallelujah. No more weather changes, hallelujah. No more traffic on 400, <laughs> glory to God. And I slip out of this earth suit and I'm in the glory realm. Yeah. What a reward, eh? And so it says another place they want to go back to Egypt is they, they missed the cucumbers. That's what they told Moses. We won't go back to the, for the cucumbers and the dills yeah. and the spices. I'm like, what? <laughs> and they said to one another, we'll appoint another leader. We'll get a new pastor and a new church and we'll return to Egypt. Yeah. That's right. Please, go quickly before I throw up on you. Yeah. <laughs> Please, quickly. And Moses and Aaron fell on their faces. Can you imagine that? They didn't know what to do. Yeah. <laughs> they fell on their face. The best thing you can ever do is fall on your face. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> and Joshua, the son of Nun. Ooh, I like this guy. And Caleb, the son of Jephthah. Of those who spied out the land, tore their clothes. And they spoke to all the congregation, the sons of Israel, saying, The land which we pass through to spy out is exceedingly good land. If the Lord is pleased with us, that he bring us into this land and give it to us, a land which flows with milk and honey. 
Only do not rebel against the Lord, and do not fear the people of the land, for they shall be our prey. <laughs> Glory to God. <laughs> Their protection has been removed from them. And the Lord is with us. Do not fear them. Hallelujah. Do not fear them. But all the congregation said to stone them with stones. Then the glory of the Lord appeared in the tent of meeting to the sons of Israel. And the Lord said to Moses, how long will this people spurn me? Where did they spurn the Lord? By not being courageous. How long will they not believe in me despite all the signs which I performed in their midst? Folks, I'm talking about signs and wonders that would baffle us today. I mean, just put it all in context here. I will smite them with pestilence. I'm going to give them acne. Worse than acne, I'm going to give them hives and everything else. I'm going to give them pestilence, mildew, blasting. Read Deuteronomy 28. Stuff that causes dermatologists to go to postgraduate study to try to learn what that new fungi is growing on people. I'll dispossess them. I'll make you into a great nation and mightier than they. Look at God's ruthfulness. But Moses said to the Lord, the Lord Egypt says, we'll hear of it, for by thy strength thou dost bring us up this people from the midst. Even Moses got into fear. What are people going to say about us? Maybe, it's, maybe God should have knocked them all out and started a new race. He wanted to do it. You know, sometimes we can intercede too much. <laughs> well, Lord, why am I having, having all this problem with this in-law? Well, I wanted to take him home 20 years ago, but you prayed for his healing. <laughs> now you're stuck with him like Abraham was stuck with Lot. <laughs> his finances were in order. His life was in order. It was ready for him to come home, but you asked me to extend his life, so I did. Now take care of the mangy thing. <laughs> hey, I'm just trying to read the scriptures to you, folks. That's right. There are certain things we just shouldn't pray about, you know? <laughs> Let God have its way, you know? Right. Fell the tree if he has to. Amen. I said that purposely for all my beloved Canadian intercessors. Verse 14, and they'll tell it to the inhabitants of this land that they heard that thou, O Lord, art in the midst of the people, for thou hast, I have seen while the cloud stands over them, now let's go before them in a pillar of cloud by night, fire by night. Now if thou dost slay this people as one man, then the nations who have heard of thy fame will say, because the Lord could not bring this people into the land which he has promised by oath, therefore he has slaughtered them in the wilderness." But now I pray, let the power of the Lord be great, just as thou hast declared. <laughs> the Lord is good, is slow to anger, abundant in loving kindness, forgiving iniquity and transgression, and no mind clear the guilty. Okay, he's like, I'll clear the guilty, let him do his work. <laughs> Visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children of the third and fourth generations. Pardon, I pray, the iniquity of this people according to the greatness of thy loving kindness, for God is good all the time. God is good. <laughs> Just as thou hast forgiven this people from Egypt until now. And the Lord said, I pardon them according to your word. Yeah. Yeah. Uh -huh. And you're going to have to deal with them. Yeah. And they're going to be a pain in your neck. And they're going to be like, you sitting on thorns and scorpions to so your gluteus maximus. And you're going to hit the rock twice and you're going to enter the promised land. Because why would Moses do it? Not because he loved the people, but because he was afraid of God's name being misaligned. And yeah. Yeah. That's good. See, I don't think John, uh, Char John Charles, one of those Wesleys, said this. <laughs> He said, God can do nothing in the earth unless man asks him to. Why that is, we don't really fully understand that. And it's true. God has given the earth to the sons of men. God has given his people an ability to bind and loosen, to pray things to happen. Sometimes we pray too much about yeah, things. That's right. And the Lord says, 
I've empowered them according to your word. But indeed, as I live, all the earth shall be filled with the glory of the Lord. Yeah. Meaning, yeah. here it is, folks. The same glory that we're to be a minister of, 2 Corinthians chapter 3. The same glory that the children of Israel were blinded from seeing. The same glory that's greater, oh, on the new covenant revelation for the preaching of the gospel, for the great commission. Hallelujah. There is a veil between that glory and God's people that get complaining, and it's built up. That veil is built up because of fear or non-courageous people. Yeah. And I don't have time for a bunch of babies. Yeah. I don't mind baby Christians, amen, but I want to hang out with people that have courageous look in their eyes, amen? amen. Yeah. Hallelujah. Yes. Yeah. I thought God is good all the time. God is good. Yeah, he is good. But his definition of his goodness is not our definition of his goodness, That's usually. Right. It's okay, you'll put up with them. Here we go, around the bend we go. Around the mountain she'll come. Na 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 na. Oh, but when we run this mountain, same place last year. Yes, son, God is good though. You see the cloud among us. But dad, I, why don't we go in oh, but to that place? You know, man, I'm looking honey and all that. Oh, you know, God has everything under control. The ways of God are mysterious, son. Uh, yeah, right, you're one of those leather necks. God's waiting for you to drop, I know that. <laughs> I'm part of that Joshua generation. Hallelujah. <laughs> so we don't want to be leathernecks. And God doesn't do this. The devil doesn't. We choose to fear instead of have faith. Okay, so. Hallelujah. God is saying, these people, you've got to put up with them, but I'm looking ahead to their descendants to see if they will be the Joshua generation I will use. Right. And so I can flood my earth with the glory. And so look at here, folks, come on. The glory of the earth to fill the earth is dependent on a people that want to go to war. Amen. Come on, folks. I ain't talking about just prayer meetings. I ain't talking about just praise and worship conferences. I ain't talking about just preaching and revival meetings. I'm talking about people that want to go out and possess the land, amen, that want to go out and do recon, that do all these things. The Bible says, Matthew 10, go into all the world. Matthew 28, you know, cast out devils, all these wonderful things. That is how the glory of God fills the earth. Hallelujah. <laughs> Verse 22, surely all the men who have seen my glory and my signs which I performed in Egypt and in the wilderness have yet have put me to test these ten times and not listened to my voice shall by no means see the land which I swore to their fathers, nor shall any of those who spurn me. God's got a pretty good number. It just wasn't, he said ten times. Where did the ten times come from? The, from the ten complainers, the ten spies. God counted every one of them. Yeah. Oh, God, you take my prayers and hide them in a bottle. That's right. We got some talking to do, son. Some of those prayers are unbelief. Anyway, verse 24, but my servant Caleb. Now, I like Caleb. You know what Caleb means in Hebrew? Kalev. You know what Kalev is in Hebrew? Woof, woof, a dog. <laughs> so here's an 80-year-old man whose name is Dog, who takes out three giants in Hebron. Hallelujah. I like this guy. Because he has a different spirit. Hallelujah. Say that. Different spirit. different spirit. And has followed me fully. I will bring him into the land which he has entered. And his descendants shall take possession of it. Now the Amalekites and the Canaanites live in the valley. And turn tomorrow and set out to the wilderness by the way of the Red Sea. And the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron, saying, How long will I bear this evil congregation who are grumbling against me? I've heard the complaints of the sons of Israel, which they are making against me. So, say to them, As I live, says the Lord, just as you have spoken to my hearing, surely will I do. Make sure what you say is what you really want. <laughs> Hello? Mm -mm -mm. This is powerful, folks. Verse 30, surely you'll come into the land which I swore. You shall not come into the land to which I swore to sell you, except Caleb, the son of Jephthah, and Joshua, the son of Nun. Your children, however, whom you said will become a prey, I will bring them in, and they shall know that the land which you have rejected. But as for you, your corpses shall fall in this wilderness. Whew. Wow. Wow. 
I think that's a pretty good uh, warning to us not to complain. But that's not the end of it, folks. I don't think we've really, I think some people enjoy complaining. I think some people enjoy having their pet fear like a little chihuahua on their lap all the time. I think people's terminology, oh, that scared me to death. Oh, that, oh, oh, you can't do that. Oh, oh, oh. Again, those people show me they've not been meditating in the Word of God, letting the Word of God get a hold of them. Are you all still with me tonight? Amen. So we're talking about courage. Amen? Now, there's a lot more we could share about, but let's go back to 2 Corinthians chapter 3. I think you get the, the idea. So 2 Corinthians chapter 3, you know, and also in the New Testament, we won't read it tonight, about 2 Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 10 talks about not following the, 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 um, the testimony of those in the wilderness. But 2 Corinthians chapter 3 is in, in a new light to us now. It says here in verse 3 of chapter 4, If our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing. In whose case the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelieving, that they may not see the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. We do not preach ourselves, but Christ Jesus as Lord, ourselves as your bondservants for Jesus' sake. For God who said, light shine out of the darkness, is the one who has shown into our hearts to give the light of the intimate knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Messiah. This is exciting, folks. So what we see here, and we've heard me preach about it before in verse 4, the God of this world. The word world here does not mean earth, but it means the age. And the Greek linguistic, he says, it's the floating mass of thoughts, opinions, maxims, speculations, hopes, and impulses, and aspirations anytime current in the world. I was driving, I never said it before publicly, I'm going to say it now, okay? I'm driving down the road a couple days ago, and I'm driving Dudley's car, and she doesn't have any uh, uh, um, old, newer CDs of mine, for they're in the back of the truck, whatever, I didn't stop to pick up my, and so I had nothing to listen to, so I just turned on the radio real quick, and there was Rush Limbaugh, okay? And uh, radio, and all these uh, radio commercials come in about, oh, everybody gets a cold this cold season. Oh, you need to get these special gutters for your house. And all this stuff is like, oh, heating oil is going to be the highest ever this winter. And all these infomercials, you know. And, and I'm listening, and the Lord says, turn it off. I heard his voice. Turn it off. He has nothing to say. Okay. Click. Now, that may be blasphemous to some Rush fans listening out there. But let's say, you know, Rush is an ego-driven, okay, marketer, okay? And needs to get baptized in the Holy Ghost and repent publicly. Hallelujah. Amen. Hallelujah. And the Rush Limbaugh Institute of Advanced Studies of Conservatism is a bunch of hill of beans. Yeah. It's entertainment. Yeah. Okay? A gifted orator that could preach the gospel instead of preaching conservative values and politics. Yeah. I know that people get inflamed, listen to him, fine, whatever, okay. I've used to listen to him before, but God told me to turn it off. God told me just a bunch of hot air. So I turned it off. And guess what? Listen. But 30 minutes later after coming out of Home Depot, I turned it back on again. And guess what they were talking about? Bestiality. So what drives this market? Okay, I learned my lesson big time. What, what drives this market is the God of this world, speculation. Speculative talk radio, come on. And so the enemy, his whole job is to put these walls or these veils to keep people from seeing the glory of God. So we're going to be going out there dealing with people that are totally bound by fear. Okay? They're bound by fear. They don't necessarily are thinking about God, okay? 
And if they are, it's just to cry out to God for help in their situation. They're totally living for themselves. They're darkened. They know no, not God at all. They're not the friend of God, okay? Second, we're going out there, not just for the sinner, we're going after the prodigals. That's right. yeah. Prodigals, sons and daughters that have been living in the pig pen, okay? We have to bring dental floss to get the, the corn flax out of their mouth, okay? And the husk they've been chewing on, the pig food, okay? We need <laughs> There's a lot of prodigal sons and daughters in our country. And our job is to be wise, to be soul winners. And we're not going to win them by a cute little marketing program. Oh, our church is giving away a car. Yeah. We're going to have a raffle drawing. Or we have a bake sale, okay? Or we're going to show, you know, a Super Bowl party. What? Or, you know, we're going to do this, you know? Yeah. So most ideas of pastors are reach the pastors to reach the young people is have a pizza party. So all play hoops together, you know, do this and that. Okay, fine, you can do that, okay? I'm not against that. But there is a Cadillac version, hallelujah. Yeah. Why settle for a, B, a, B, a VW bug when you have a Cadillac version? There is a deeper realm of glory. Amen. For evangelism. Am I making sense tonight? Yes. Yes. Hallelujah. And so we see that this... Glory ministry continues in chapter 5 and says in verse 18 that he's given to us this ministry of reconciliation. Now, that doesn't mean the whole world's going to get saved. Doesn't mean Alpharetta is going to get saved. There's people who live in Alpharetta that'll never get saved, that are Alexander the coppersmith, that are against the gospel, that are enemies of God, okay? So, how does God initiate? A move of the Spirit. Let's conclude tonight with Psalm 68. What I like about this is that the whole idea that we're filling the tremors to do evangelism means that God's about to do something. That's right. Let's be honest about it. We, folks, we need new blood. That's right. yep. Not for this church, but we need to bring in new souls, okay? Because every person here has a gifting, okay? God hasn't called you just to sit here. He hasn't called you just to be a mom, you know, and a good wife. He's called you to release your gifts to help other people. And I don't want to keep laying hands on the same people so much until your hair starts to recede, you know? <laughs> and I thought this morning, I thought, well, maybe I was just a little bit probing too much, you know? Maybe I was repeating myself too much. And the Lord was like, don't quit second guessing me. I walk out the door, okay. That's right. But right there in that parking lot at North Point area, okay, there's like 200 young people hanging out there in the parking lot on Saturday night. Thank you, sir. Hallelujah. Anything else? Yeah, where's the gay bars? Where's the Muslim mosque? Where's the... Ooh. He goes, yeah, there's a, he goes, there one other street. Let me know. Yeah. We're serious about this. Yeah. He says, hmm. He says, you know, we live in an upper middle class neighborhood where people think they know it all and have it all. Don't really have any need for God. I says, yeah. Mm -hmm. That's why we're here. Let's break the mold. Are you ready, folks? The worst thing that happened, we just get killed and go to heaven. I mean, hallelujah. <laughs> Whoa, Psalm 68, verse 1. Let God arise, let his enemies be splattered. <laughs> My paraphrase. Let his enemies be scattered. Now notice the word arise here is the same word arise, kumi, for our CD. Arise, okay, means to get up from the sleep. You know that nice little song we sing? Arise, shine, for your light has come. <laughs> Forget it, wrong melody. Not that melody, the wrong melody, okay? It's not get up, little sweetheart. It's rise up. It's the same Hebrew word for getting up, somebody who's slumbering and is oversleeping. Kumi! Get up! Don't you do it again. Whew, she take off to school. Run up all those flight of stairs. Take it off to school. Trying to get to school in time. Okay? That's the Hebrew word for God arising. It's also the same Hebrew word for resurrection of the dead. Ooh, I like this stuff. When Jesus said to the young girl, Damsel, I say to thee, Telakumi. It's a feminine 
ending on a prefix, tell us that, tell it, kumi, say that, kumi. And she came back to life. Oh, hallelujah. It's the same word for re- people when they rise from the dead. They're arising actually from sleep, the Bible says. And it's used the third time in Ephesians 5. Wake up, O sleeper, and Messiah will shine upon you. Redeem the time for the days are evil. Hallelujah. Be continually filled, intoxicated with the Holy Spirit. Hallelujah. I love it. Amen? Now notice, to rise up, we're rising up, the Bible says, from dead works. What's dead works? Anything that does not bring people to Jesus. Let God arise, let his enemies be splattered. Let those who hate him flee before him. I want to find out those who hate God. I know those who hate God. Keep your finger here. Go to Proverbs. I found this out, man. I, I know who the people who hate God are right now. I got a good news report. God's been telling me to pray for Israel recently. I just found out tonight that there has been, they've caught the, yesterday 12 suicide bombers on their way to blow up Israeli civil, civilian areas. 12! They've stopped 12 suicide bombers on their way just recently. We need to keep praying because the, uh, they're saying uh, on the Depka files that uh, the Palestinians are really ramping up terror right now. Okay? Interesting, huh? Now it says here in chapter 8, in verse 35, this is so interesting. It says, chapter 8, 35 of Proverbs. He who finds me finds life and attains favor from the Lord, but he who sins against me injures himself. Okay, the word injure is Hamas, brings violence upon himself, and those who hate me love what? Those who hate me love death. Courts, C O U. Courts death, wow. It sounds like today people, I'm telling you, there's so many sh- forensic TV shows now and death and this and that. It's disgusting. All these A&E programs and History Channel, all this death. Disgusting out there. You know what I'm saying? Who cares about that? So, well, those are the people that's popular because those people hate God. So in Psalm 68, let God arise, let his enemies be scattered. Let all those who hate him flee before him. So we're going to come encounter as we go witnessing, okay? I'll give you some practicals before we end tonight. We're going to come encounter with people who hate God, okay? And I don't care how much you love them and love them. You cannot, you're not supposed to witness to them. I know we're supposed to witness and when see all people, God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son. But don't get caught up into these people who hate God, okay? Number one, they're called planted time wasters. Proverbs says, if you're in the presence of a foolish man and you do not discern words of wisdom, depart from that man. What you'll find as we go out witnessing, Satan will send people out from underneath the rocks, okay? Creatures that, you know, that live in the swamps of sin, okay? And they will come out supernaturally, they don't even know why, they're puppets, okay? And they will come out to engage you in a conversation, okay, to waste your time. And when you're there and you begin to witness to them and they're not open but they still want a dialogue, what you do is shake the dust off and move on. Well, I've been, I just wanted somebody to talk to me, you know, because I've been talking to everybody else tonight, everybody rejected me. Don't fall into that pity party, Okay. Maybe you witnessed the 20, 30 people, okay? And they, didn't, they just gave you the cold shoulder. Fine. They're not rejecting you. They're rejecting Jesus. But you will get come across people that will waste your time, especially if we start going to a very productive fishing hole. Hallelujah. And, we, and you'll, you'll notice the enemy will start sending people there. Folks, we're talking about war. We're not about just going out evangelism. We're talking about we are going into the enemy's camp looking for POWs, prisoners of war, and MIAs, prodigals, okay? Missing in action, okay? We're going to rescue them. <clears throat> and you can never let your guard down because the enemy is going to, he wants to have people on his side. 
He doesn't want to lose his cronies. He doesn't want to lose his motley crew. He doesn't want to lose people that will eventually come against him. Okay? So you've got to look for planted time wasters. Okay? Don't waste your time with them. You need it. I hope you remember this, folks. Don't say, oh, yeah, I remember Scott saying that. Take all these years of street witnessing experience, okay, and just try to encapsulize it, soak it in tonight. Because you will be tested on this. <laughs> there will be people that will want to engage you, okay? Second, when you go out witnessing, you don't, as a woman, go by yourself, okay? You go two by two, okay? Period. It just, okay? And women, don't use your cute looks to, and get guys interested to bring them to church. We're not trying to get people into church, okay, like that. And I know before, okay, I don't want to get into all the details about that, okay? And you, ladies, you're going to have to pick up on some ladies that they come witnessing with us, but other churches will join us, okay? Some people do not have an anointing. They have a flirting anointing, okay? They like to flirt with people, okay? They get off in the conversation aspect of talking to people. Okay, and you're going to have to tell people how to dress and how to respond and how to act, okay, because we cannot compromise ourselves in this situation. Again, the devil, you say, you're looking for a fight. We already, it already, it already, I've already been in the fight, folks. God says, go witnessing. Confirmation, the pastor in the parking lot says, my church hasn't grown. We've been having great services, powerful services, but my church ain't grown because I haven't been witnessing. Hello, ding dong. Hello, come on. Yeah. I'm trying, to, it's like telling you you can no longer drink Coca Cola anymore, even though we live in the capital of Coca Cola, Atlanta, okay? You have to change your diet. You know how hard it is for people to just change their diet? This is the lifestyle change I'm trying to get you in. Because if we get you into this, God will make sure you have the money. Because he doesn't want to lose you. Yes. Amen. God will make sure that you're healed because he needs you out there. Amen. Clarity will come to your mind about issues. You've been praying. Oh, it's so awesome. Another thing we want to do is hospital visitation. Okay? We need to visit those that are sick. We need to pray for people. Hallelujah. We'll go into details about this later, how you can do it, whatever, okay? But uh, we already have one lady that works in the hospital. Glory to God. Why haven't we done anything about it? Because it's not that we don't want to do anything about it. It's just because other things crowd us out. Other things we need to do is, and there's so many details I want to talk about tonight, but let's keep it real simple. Two-thirds of God's name is go. <laughs> Two-thirds backwards is do. <laughs> and the middle third will make you odd. I want people in Alfred to know, oh, yeah, we know about those people. Are you all still with me? Amen. It's like I'll be standing at the subway stop one night. Thousands of people coming home from Manhattan, living in New York City. Thousands of people walking by. It's like, oh, look at these people. Oh, Lord, we got to reach them. And I said, one man get off, and I'll send. I would just see something on him. And the Lord says, that's the one. Come on, folks. Go in, gets born again. Hallelujah. And then you come back from that. It's like everything becomes amplified. The flowers are more beautiful. The birds are singing prettier. The food tastes better. Oh, this peanut butter is awesome. Hallelujah. You start entering into a place of God's pleasure. Amen. Because the angels rejoice more over one sinner than a hundred who don't need repentance. Actually, you don't have to wait for us Saturday night. If you want to meet here and pray and go out, go for it. 
Where are we going to go? Well, start looking through the newspapers. Look, look for, I'm telling you, folks, we've got to find the darkest places. Look for, you know, the, the, the rock and roll concerts, okay? Look for, <laughs> look for the psychic places. Look, I mean, just flea markets on Saturday. Anything, if anything moves, let's go for it. Hallelujah. If it doesn't move, we'll raise it from the dead, huh? <laughs> Nursing home ministry. There's a captive audience. I mean, you got to be moved with your compassion. And we got to start developing these teams that go out. Amen? Because I'm going to be, no, I, the Lord told me this to tell you this tonight, okay? And this is for you guys and for the camera. When was the last time you won somebody to Jesus? You don't have to tell me. How many souls did you win to the Lord in 2005? Okay. So, you know that there's believers like Moody and others that would not go to sleep until they won one person to Jesus each night. They would stand on a rainy Chicago street corner waiting. Lord, I gave you a bow. I want to at least tell one person a day about you. Sure enough, that person would come by, get born again, become a pastor of a church. I mean, so many testimonies like this. Personally, oh, I love it. Hallelujah. Let God arise, let his enemies be scattered. Let those who hate him flee before him. Yes, you, we will encounter witches and warlocks. Hallelujah. Now, when you go witnessing, okay, one person, you're going two by two, one does the talking, the other does the praying. Okay? It's not a time for apologetics. It's a time to go for the juggler, Okay? And we will incorporate different things, okay, to help you learn about this. But again, this is an ongoing education. Even your instructors are learning each time they go out. Hallelujah. <laughs> but it's fun, okay? You've got to bring people into godly sorrow, okay? Well, I'm a good person, okay? Well, you ever told a lie? Oh, well, yeah, we all lie, okay? The Bible says you... All of sin and fallen short of the glory of God. All liars, liars will be in the lake of fire. So you're not a good Christian, a good person. God says you're a sinner. And you're going to burn forever in the lake of fire. See, you know, just don't, just don't tell them Jesus loves them. Oh, yeah, I know it. I love them too. Dup, dup. Yeah, I know Jesus loves me. You've got to bring people into a place of repentance. Godly sorrow, Okay. And what you do is share your testimony and share scriptures because God's word never returns void. Hallelujah. Oh, I got so much in me, we can go hours on this. A few little tidbits for this week, you can witness this week. The next thing, whenever you're in public places, look for opportunities. The reason we don't have more opportunities is because we don't time management. We're usually rushing somewhere to rush somewhere else to get out of that place to get somewhere else. But if you get up and have a little more space of time, hallelujah, you're able to witness more because you're not in a rush in certain places. Second, third, fourth, fifth, whatever it is down the line, get up early in the morning and pray. Set your day straight and on the right track by getting up in the morning, and then God will send people across your path. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And those that you talk to, invite them to church. This congregation is very rare because I don't see many people bring many people to church here. Don't get mad at me. I do not, and you guys know at least five people out there, don't you? If you don't know five people, then we'll pray for you, but something is desperately wrong with you. <laughs> but let's be honest, I don't see people coming to church and bringing other people to church. Actually, for me, when I'm coming off the road, I'm like, it's like, man, thousands of people in the altar calls over the years. It's incredible. But if I wasn't doing this full time, I'd be working, laboring with my hand, amen, to give to him who has need, and I would be soul winning. Folks, I'm telling you, there's nothing like it on earth. It begins with a desire, and then you move into the discipline, and then it becomes a delight. Once you break through the disciplinary phrase, okay, then it becomes a delight. You hit a zone. Hallelujah. 
and it makes for happy Christians. And so God arises, let his enemies be scattered. Verse four, sing to God, sing praises to his name, lift up a song for him who rides through the deserts, whose name is the Lord, exult before him, a father of the fatherless, a judge for the widows, is God in his holy habitation. You say, well, people don't wanna to listen to me in this area. Folks, there's Latinos that will. There's immigrants that do. Every immigrant I see, I witness to. A father of the fatherless, a judge for the widows, is God in his holy habitation. God makes a home for the lonely. He leads out the prisoners into prosperity. Only the rebellious dwell in a parched land. Now notice here, God, when thou go forth before thy people, now dost march to the wilderness, the earth quaked, the heavens dropped rain at the presence of God. Sinai itself quaked at the presence of God, the God of Israel. Thou dost shed abroad a plentiful rain, O God. Thou dost confirm thy inheritance when it was parched. Thy creatures settled in it. Thou dost provide in thy goodness for the poor, O God. The Lord gives the command, the women who proclaim the good news are a great army. You've heard me teach on it before. Let's apply it to evangelism. God is supernaturally rises up, okay? God is telling me, God is telling another pastor that rents this building, okay, to start doing evangelism, okay? And folks, if we don't obey, we'll become fossilized, dead, swamp water. Yeah. Who's with me? Yeah. Let's do it. Let's have some fun. Hallelujah. Let's have church on the streets. Glory to God. Let's start. Oh, we got that over with. I'm glad. No, I can't wait till next Saturday. I want to start doing it now. Hallelujah. Let's start looking for places. Hmm. The Lord gives the command the women who proclaim the good news are a great army. Verse 18, thou hast ascended on high, thou hast led captive thy captives, thou hast received gifts among men, even among the rebellious that they, the Lord may dwell there. Let's conclude with Ephesians chapter 4, what I just read, let's put it in the context of soul winning. so quiet, isn't it? Where's all the cars? Have you noticed hardly any cars drove by outside? You know why? Super bail. They're consumed. Instead, we're plotting our takeover of the planet. Hallelujah. <laughs> <laughs> Hey, John got fired up today. You guys are going to enjoy his ministry on Sunday and do the joint service together. Listen, folks, listen, come on. Let's go for it. I'm not like what Debbie said. I said, let's do Alpharetta. Let's just let's see Alpharetta get touched. Amen? Right. Yeah. You just got to think like this all the time. When you're driving down the road, look for where police people are hanging out. Hey, do that. And you guys, you know, doing that, I'm a little more specialized. I got to go take on some pastors. That's okay. Hallelujah. <laughs> if he tells me to stand up in the church and blow the shofar, I will. Sunday morning, during announcements, I will do it. <laughs> He's already been telling me to do it, and I've kind of been slacking off about it. Well, what the, well, 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 Stay tuned, you'll find out. Verse seven, here we go. But each one of us grace was giving, chapter four, verse seven, according to the measure of the Messiah's gift. Now for those listening on the video, may I not understand, what's God gonna go and prophesy to pastors for? Well. 
If you look at the watchman, and that's been used, by the way, the watchman, Jeremiah, excuse me, uh, Ezekiel 33 and Ezekiel chapter 3, the watchman stands on the wall, he sees the sword coming, he blows a trumpet to warn the people, right? If he doesn't warn the people, the blood is on his head, right? If he warns them, they don't listen, the blood's on their own head. I don't want your blood on my head, okay? That's pretty heavy. So people have taken that saying, we've got to warn the lost, we've got to warn the unsaved, lest their blood be on us. Yes, con corporately as a whole, that's true in the scripture, but contextually, that is not what the Bible is saying. Ezekiel 33 telling the trump the, to blow the trumpet because the Lord is bringing a judgment on the city. The first people he's supposed to warn are chapter 34, the false shepherds. And how many ministries out there are warning the shepherds? Well, pray for me. As we go where no man's gone before except Jesus. <laughs> And they all were killed for it. Paul and all of them, Peter, they all were killed for it. <laughs> Hallelujah. Hallelujah. But we got to do it. I can't shrink back from the call. Because if we can just get one pastor to see, hallelujah, and the blinders come off, look at all the thousands of people he will influence. Amen. Amen. And I believe God will send us to those situations. It's okay, folks. Hallelujah. I know it's not something you learn to do in Bible school. I know you don't hear people talking about this. I know it sounds not politically correct, but we have to do it. Just like you have to start bringing souls to church and getting these souls born again. Amen. And being a witness, a living epistle, I've got to go to the level he's called me. Hallelujah. Because I've been doing this stuff for years. I need to go and... Pray for me. <laughs> Not that I'll be safe, but I'll have boldness. Yes. Glory. Amen. Hallelujah. <laughs> Stay tuned. Well, can we go with you? I don't know. Maybe just Bo and I. Bo with the infrared camera right there. Hallelujah. <laughs> But I read my Bible, I see things, you know, why are we using Ezekiel 30 if are talking about the law? That's the false shepherds we're supposed to warn. Who are the false shepherds? I can tell right away, the ones that are overweight, first of all. <laughs> the Bible says they've been feeding themselves. <laughs> anyway, I don't know that went over real big. Anyway. <laughs> Well, there's a lot of other things. You know, they dominate the sheep. They, this is the one that God doesn't like. God wants to take over Sunday morning again. Yeah. Amen. Anyway, verse 8. Therefore it says, when he ascended on high, he led captive a host of what? Then we sing this morning, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me to bring release to the prisoners, captives. Oh, Lord, you must be crying out tonight. They're really captivated watching that big one-eyed plasma. The Super Bowl party is going on right now. Churches trying to bring people into church. Put up a big screen TV. He gave gifts unto men. Now, this is the exciting part. As we bring them to a knowledge of Jesus, you are now responsible to bring them into their gifting. Okay, it's not your job just to bring people here and throw them on our laps and you clean them. No, each of us are called to make disciples. If we each would just make 12, we can multiply pretty quick, okay? So you're going to find people that have been in the caverns of sin, religion, religiosity, whatever, a blinder of veil, and God wants to rescue them, pull them out, and then he's going to give them fresh gifting. And this is where everybody gets excited, amen? Because when you see a son or daughter in the faith exceed what you're doing. That's right. Yeah. That's like. That's right. Amen? Yeah. 
That's exciting. We need youth here. We need young people. We need college age. Amen? We need... Now, I'm going to share the statistics with you. Don't plan on this being the most popular ministry. And the reason why, I went to a 12,000-member church, and when we would have an outreach, at the most, we'd have 50 people show up on a Saturday night. At the most! And at first, we expected Billy Joe Doherty or one of the many pastors on staff to be there to run it. But you know what Billy Joe said to us? He says, you guys do it. Because if I hold your hand, you'll never really learn how to do it. Just go do it. You have my blessing. Go for it. <laughs> Folks, I'm telling you, there was times that we'd be interceding and the, the other group would be on the streets that we wouldn't, we saw things happen. I, you know, a, a, an angel would ride in a horse one night into the, into the prayer meeting. Scare the snot out of everybody. Excuse me, scare the French vanilla out of everybody. You want me to go on and on? When we would meet the afterglow, the best part was the fellowship. After we would witness together, we would come back and have fellowship, the most incredible fellowship. We would be under the table at Denny's at night, <laughs> laughing because we were counting all the pieces of gum stuck underneath the table. Just out of it, messed up. And then people would come over and ask what we've been drinking. And then we, the, the witnessing would start again, you know? <laughs> and then we'd get home and can't wait for church again. We'd get to be here early, 6 a.m. Where's everybody? Hallelujah. Because we recognize the flow. We recognize World War III would break out during the week, okay, to try to keep us. Every week the devil comes in craftier, try to keep us, our concentration off witnessing, okay? And then, boom, we get out in the streets and it'd be hard slugging for a little bit sometimes. And then you feel the prayers of the prayer group kicking in. And then, boom, boom, God will start bringing people across your path. Hallelujah. And then the afterglow was hard to hit, and the glory, and we all had come back and couldn't wait to fellowship, and then Sunday morning was like, man, pulling up the Costco and getting free gas. Hallelujah. It's like, this is awesome. Hallelujah. And Billy Joe would always change his message. I don't know why I'm saying this, but for somebody here, we'd all be laughing drunk, you know. And the people, that were the hardest people were the Sunday Christians to deal with. They were harder than the people in the streets. Billy Joe would say, you know, when I preach and I'm looking at 10,000 people, most of them are deadheads anyway, I would look at your guys' robe as I would gain strength by looking at you guys. Because you're like, <laughs> he said, I'd watch you guys. He'd get up there and you know, even the guy take it in the offering. Turn your Bible to John 3.16. Yeah! John 3.16. I got the new revelation. You guys get, and we're just like, and the usher's like, Shh, be quiet over here. No, we're not going to be quiet. <laughs> I remember one night we went to, we would go to, we, we found three gay bars in Tulsa. And we began to prophesy. One of them burned down. Hallelujah. The other one went out of business, and the third one we began, to, we began to take on. It's out of business now also. And we would go there, and now they wouldn't allow us on the parking lot, okay? But we would stay, we'd get next door at the 7-Eleven, okay? And we would witness. It was so awesome. I remember one night, there was a whole truckload full of cowboys, the baseball bats. They wanted to beat up a bunch of gays inside. And we stopped them. They all got born again. I remember at 4 o'clock in the morning leading a lesbian to the Lord, sitting on top of her car and saying, it was worth everything tonight. Demons just coming out of her. Crying like a baby. Hallelujah. All those guys and gals I witnessed with are all now either in full-time ministry or in major service for God somewhere. Come on, folks. This is the fruit. I'm talking about people that are so on fire for God. 
today. I can show you. They're all wild fanatics. And we all were not like that before. The reason we started doing this is because, you know, I don't know, we all just kind of hanged out together. And we, but man, these guys and gals, you just say, Ugh. and they already got 10 hands on you already, casting devils out of you. I mean, they're so quick. I tell you, if I ever had a problem, I'd call them to pray for me. I mean, they know about casting out devils. Poof. Now, it was funny, when I first came to Atlanta, I hanged around this, you know, this family, you know, I don't say anything, that said that they're into intercession, they're an intercessory group, okay? And they know all about prayer and stuff. I said, great, well, let's go witness here on the streets. Oh, no, I haven't prayed up. I don't have any prayer covering. You don't need no prayer covering. Jesus is praying night and day. Let's go, man. <laughs> Did you hear that? Jesus is praying night and day. Let's go. Hallelujah. Whoa, I'm, uh, totally by fear. Well, well, sweetheart, you could prophesy in the church and tell me all the things that's wrong with me, okay? But why can't you go in the streets and operate in the same way? Hmm. Sorry, I just zoned out there. Folks, putting on John 3.16 and wearing rainbow hair at the football game and standing in the end zone to get the camera to look at us, you know, is not going to do it, okay? (laughs) They're mocking us. Are you ready? You, I need your help, okay? I need people to find locations. I need you to start doing some recon. Start probing. Looking where the enemy sleeper cells are, okay? I don't want to have to go down to little five points. I don't need a recon there. I don't even know what's on down in little five points, okay? In different parts of the city, okay? Let's start concentrating on this area. Okay? If people have some creative ideas to write a track, fine, I don't have a problem with it. We should get it. I know where all the male executives are on the weekend. At least once a month, they're walking in in or out of Best Buy. I know, without a doubt. I'm scoping out places to find out where people are, okay? I'm going after the soccer moms. I know where they are. They're at the Costco, okay? (laughs) Trying to save some money. Let's start, oh, where else are they? They're at the horse, they're riding their horses on Saturday afternoon, okay? They're taking their kids to gymnastics on Tuesday night. Most churches have relegated their evangelism to TV now. Well, we're going to reach people because it's so hard to reach them. They're so busy in this culture that we're going to reach them through radio or through TV. Whatever. Okay, you keep doing the same things over and over, expect different results, it's a sign of mental illness. Yes, people who get saved watching Christian TV. That's not, but people need flesh and blood to talk to. Now, the last thing I will say is that when you get in conversation with somebody, and not everybody doesn't get saved right away, okay? You always conclude saying, listen, can I say a prayer for you? Always people said, yes, you can pray for me. They don't expect you to pray for them right then. Just grab their hand, that's what you do. If you've been soaking and you're sensitive to the Holy Spirit, you grab their hand and say, Lord, I just pray your spirit comes upon this man right now and touch him from the top of their head at the soles of their feet. In Jesus' name. Have a good day, sir. Bye. Most of them go, oh, wow, what is that? Or they look shocked. You know why? Because they just encountered the creator of the universe. And no matter what bar they go to or rodeo, okay, 
or New Orleans Mardi Gras celebration, they will never again feel that feeling again until they, they draw closer to Jesus. They are now hooked. Because God's treasure came out of you, the Garden of Eden came out of you to touch them. It doesn't mean they get saved, but now they have a signature and they, and they can't shake it. So when you talk to people, remember you're Holy Ghost positive. You're a carrier, a tainted blood supply. Hallelujah. You're Holy Ghost positive. Now, it's a shame that no, I, I've never had a Christian come to my door the whole time I lived in Alpharetta witnessing to me. I've had Muslims, I mean, uh, yeah, Muslims and Jehovah Witnesses and Mormons. I haven't had one spiritual Christian come to my door. That's a shame. So what we need to start, to start doing is we need some people to start thinking about neighborhoods. Go start knocking on some doors. Amen? Just walk up and start talking to people. You'll be surprised what will happen. You've got to get over the rejection, okay? It was like that when I was in sales. When I first got married, I was selling office machines, okay? And I walked through a business park, knocking on doors, get rejected. I get all frustrated, get in my car, get relieved. The Lord says, you forgot one door. Oh, yeah, whatever. No, go there. I knock on it, sell a $10,000 machine right on the spot. It's always like that. It's like when you don't want to witness, you're about to want to go home now, okay? That's when something's about to break through. Now, what you'll be an experience is all these angels will come and support because they're here to support people getting born again. Now you're not going to have any more boring days. Now you're going to get up in the morning. Ah, hallelujah. Who can I witness to today? If you have to, practice on your dog. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> practice on your kids. Teach your kids how to witness. Tell them to line up their Barbie dolls or line up, you know, their teddy bears and have a healing line or something. I mean, just begin to make it a lifestyle. Are you all getting it? I mean, the reason I'm preaching so much is because you need to start smiling more. Hallelujah. I keep on thinking you're not getting it. You're not wondering about who's winning the game right now, are you? Who really cares? Let me tell you something that really caused the Altoona church to witness a lot. I took them out to street witness one night. And we had a shofar drive by. Down the street from the church is the minor league baseball stadium for, I think it's the Pittsburgh Steelers or the Phillies, one of those two, okay? And it's owned by three people, by a Jewish man, another man, and then Jerome Bennis, who's the running back for the Philadelphia, I mean, the Pittsburgh Steelers. And I didn't know who these owners were, but I began to pray in front of the stadium that this stadium would be used for evangelism. Joe and all the congregation start laughing because the Lord tells me to prophesy. I see three owners, and one of them has cancer. And God is going to heal one of them to touch him, something like that. And then Joe, bless God. God did you know? I said, no. The three owners told me the owners. I said, one of the owners has cancer. I didn't know that. And they got so excited. This is a former Baptist church, folks. A former Baptist pastor who went to Bob Jones University, which is the most encrusted anti-charismatic unit in the South, okay? He got so tired, he got touched by the glory of God. And so he, he, he was, somebody, a spirit-filled pastor had retired or something for ministry and was given this church to Joe. And Joe was cleaning out the pastor's library and found this book there called The Gentle Whisper of a Secret Place. Blew the dust off it, actually. I had met that pastor at a Christian TV program. He didn't even read the book. I gave it to him. He just threw it on the shelf. Joe, a former Southern Baptist, Bob Jones University, <laughs> got the book, started reading it, started weeping and crying, and said, I didn't know miracles still happened today. They invited me to come to his church. Now, there was another pastor there who, who came who was a Assembly of God pastor, okay? And he sat in the back and sneered at me, a veil all over his face. The first night, pastor took me back to the, the hotel, and I told him, I said, Pastor Joe, who's that guy sitting in the back row? 
is what he means. I said, there's some guy in the center back row just judging me the whole service. I said, if he doesn't repent, God's going to judge him. And Joe went, oh, you know who that is? I said, no, he's the leading Assembly of God church in our area. Well, I don't care, A.G. who G. That guy is going to get judged by God if he doesn't repent. Guess what happened the next night? He fell into appendicitis and immediately was in the hospital. And Joe went to visit him. So Joe's like, wow, what's going on in these meetings? Remember, he's new to all this, okay? And so I, he goes, I like you, but you like the scripture, you like the Jewish people, and you like evangelism. He goes, these recycled river people, they don't even evangelize. They just sit on the floor and just, you know, do the Hoover maneuver, just roll around like a lint machine. They, they, they like to soak, but they don't do anything with it. And so they started, and all these signs and wonders began to happen, okay? That's what, why we kept on going back to Pennsylvania. That's why you guys are going there. Hallelujah. Just throw another layer on the foundation there. listening to our message today to you. Perhaps you have a friend, perhaps yourself are sitting there and wondering, where would I go if I died today? We'd like to give you a great privilege of praying with us and leading you to a knowledge of Jesus the Messiah. The Bible says, if any man or woman would call upon the name of Jesus, they would be saved. The Greek word for saved is healed, delivered. It's a wonderful promise. You're there now in your automobile, perhaps at home listening. Go ahead and pray this prayer with me. Say, Dear Father, I ask you in the name of Jesus to forgive me of my sins. The Bible says, if anybody would call upon your name, they would be saved. I'm calling today, Lord, save me, forgive me, cleanse me, take all of my sins and cast them into the sea of forgetfulness. Father, I'm coming running home to you now. In your name I pray. Amen. God bless you. We love you guys.